Create Peace at Home is a show dedicated to the voices of social justice movements. We bring to you guests who are engaged in making a difference in the lives of those who are forgotten. We are committed to finding solutions which make people safe and communities thrive. We believe that people have powerful stories about personal transformation. When shared, these stories begin a process of healing. Through these stories, we connect different issues which speak to the equity for everyone. I'm Buna Chima, your host. Welcome to Create Peace at Home. Welcome to Create Peace at Home. In the studio with me tonight are two very interesting and very talented people. Interesting and talented from two very different perspectives and you're gonna to get to know them really well, I hope. And please stay with us for the entire show because we don't want you to miss out on any of the excitement that we might produce tonight. Um, let me introduce my guests to you. Sitting to my left is Amir Sultani, who is doing a documentary in West Oakland about recycling. And with us all in the studio is also Pastor Landon Goodwin. Welcome to both of you. And Pastor, I would like to start with you as someone who has been recycling for a long time and has actually had quite a lengthy relationship with how recycling and you have sort of become partners. Yes, um, recycling um, to me, it became a way of life. I have to speak very candidly and very honest about it. Um, I had made some pretty bad decisions in life which led me uh, into homelessness and uh, became homeless and uh, finding work is very sparingly at the time and I learned about recycling and so I utilized recycling to, for my livelihood, you know, it uh, paid the bills, kept a roof over my head periodically, you know, when I could. Uh, I spent a lot of time under the stars as well, but nevertheless, recycling sustained me for a long time. Let's talk a little bit about when you say, you know, spent some time under the stars. Uh, we don't need to go into details of uh, your personal story if you're not willing to go there, but I think it might be interesting for the audience to sort of know what that looks like in West Oakland when somebody says, I've spent time under the stars. Well, um, like I said, it was because of some very uh, bad decisions that I made that led me uh, not to have my home anymore in uh, 96 when I lost it. Um, but uh, there's a lot of people who are out there and they're out and about and they're out there for many numbers of reasons, you know, or any number of reasons they're out there. And uh, you're just sleeping on the street, you know, you don't, um, the worst thing about it is that, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult because the city don't want you staying there, you know. Um, there's people and residents who think that you're urban blight, you know, and uh, so you're attacked from all kinds of angles and then there's, it can be dangerous out there as well. But, uh, you know, I lived a life of homelessness for quite a while. Uh, but I, you know, I was thankful um, for recycling. And I had to go back to that because I was very thankful for recycling because it really did uh, sustain me and keep me, uh, uh, and then periodically I was able to get a room and things like that. But uh, most of the time, uh, I spent time outside. And during a day, let's say in the 90s, when you were recycling, um, how much stuff could you take to Allied? Well, uh, wow, it varied, but you know, um, I could take as much as uh, go out at night and uh, spend time, eight hours uh, recycling, bringing anywhere from $150, $200, sometime even more, you know, which helped me uh, help other people as well, because a lot of people didn't make as much as I did, and we became kind of like a community, you know, and uh, we just bonded together. So, yeah, I made quite a bit of money at times. For people who do not know what Eli Allied, excuse me, Allied Recycling Center is, it's a center that was established in the 1990s, Amir? Yeah, I think so. It's and called Alliance Scrap and Metal. Alliance Allied, Allied uh, sorry folks. Um, yeah, um, it's a, you know, it's, it's a place where people can bring bottles and cans, aluminum, cop, at, at a certain point, you know, those, those are the main, main things, bottles and cans, really. Um, and it's just, it's just a very vibrant, uh, you know, vibrant place, which I sort of found by accident after I'd moved there. Mm -hmm. And that's where Landon and I met, actually. Yeah. So in a way, it's always been 
in a way, it, func it functions as a community center, yeah, oddly yeah. enough, where you, uh, in a way, it's a commodities floor. In a way, it's a giant trash can, um, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. In a way, it's where it crawls with smells and all those things. Um, but in a way, it's the heart of the environmental movement. In some perspectives, it's a very expensive piece of real estate. So it's many things. Yes, it is. Um, depending on who's looking at it and who's in there. And sometimes the neighborhood looks, as it, looks at it very differently as though the people who are, you know, trying to, well, it's like a job for some of the folks and it's their livelihood. And to try and stop people from having access to a livelihood seems extremely cool to me. Mm -hmm. And in Oakland, it, ever since at least I've known about it, there have been mm -hmm. ups and downs in terms of with the city council and uh, the neighborhoods and mm -hmm. consultants got hired to figure out what the future might look like. So for you, seeing all those uh, battles in a sense, uh, what, what were you thinking during those times? What I found out was that um, they tried to blame Alliance, the recycle center, uh, for all the blight that was there and for uh, saying that they were uh, contributing to a drug community and things like that. But those things were going on long before Alliance was really established. You know, there was mm -hmm. prostitution going out there. People were selling drugs out there. People were using drugs out there. But they tried to blame Alliance for it because a lot of their customers, you know, some are good and some are bad, just like in any occupation. You find police officers, some are good, some are bad. Or in the housed community. Some Wherever are they are, some, some are bad. good and some are bad. And so uh, they tried to blame Alliance, but Alliance was good because what it did was help a lot of people get back on track. Alliance um, didn't discriminate against anyone. And actually the owner tried to help people by uh, giving them part-time jobs sometime. Uh, uh, or casual labor jobs, allowing them to come in there and help unload some of the trucks of the customers that came in. Uh, the problem was with the community is that, you know, they, they figured that most of the people who were homeless there was only hanging around and being homeless because Alliance was there and so they would camp out near and about it because that's where they were making their livelihood. But, you know, these people had been there long before Alliance got there. So, you know, I don't think it was fair to just So do you that feel way. that in a way Alliance brought something to the community that eased the pain of a lot of people that were living in that part of West Oakland? I agree because with, it, with that because um, there were ladies who were prostituting and mm -hmm. they stopped prostituting, they just started recycling. Uh, there was um, people who were stealing and then robbing and doing all kinds of things and they stopped doing it because they could recycle. Um, there was even people who were selling drugs who quit selling drugs because now they could recycle. They got them a truck and started recycling and, and, and went uh, rather legit, you know. And uh, so, yeah, it did a lot of good. And for me personally, it did a lot of good because it helped sustain me to get me to the position that I am in today, you know. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a little while. Yeah. Amir, when did you decide that this needed to be documented? <laughs> um, <laughs> did it start with a little handheld it camera? Did. And now, you where know, are we headed? When, when I moved to West Oakland because my brother was there mm -hmm. and I was actually staying at his apartment um, in Magnolia Row. And I, you know, my family had immigrated to America, but I hadn't really explored America. I never, never really claimed it as my own. When I went to West Oakland, I don't know why, but it, I finally felt as though this is my country and I'm gonna see it, smell it, taste it, make it my own. Um, and then you would look from above the window where I was in, and you would see day after day people pushing these shopping carts yeah. around day after day into the night, into mm -hmm. the morning. And the sound of the wheel of the shopping cart, right, against the asphalt. It was such an anomaly in a sense, right? Because the shopping cart is the ultimate symbol of a consumer society, That's right? right? It's a big <laughs> extension of our bellies and it mm -hmm. goes around and we fill it with all good things. You know, all the marketing, all the colors, mm -hmm. all boom, in the belly. But these shopping carts were empty, Buna. And the people on them, it was, it was like, the shopping cart was so many things. It was a walking stick. Mm -hmm. It was something people were leaning on. It was a house, it was a home. It was the bedroom, it was the kitchen, it mm -hmm. was the, you know, it was everything. And so it was a bit much, you know. <laughs> and it was, I was curious, but 
but I didn't really, you know, you're busy, right? And this is constantly taking place on the periphery, but you're busy. So finally, one day, I was looking out, and an older gentleman was pushing his shopping cart down the street. And half his body was paralyzed. And so he was pushing this shopping cart with half his body. Um, his name was Jefferson Miles. And unfortunately, I just learned that he passed away a few weeks ago, oh, a few months ago. That. Yeah, beautiful guy. So I went down, and so it's like whether you look at the world through the window or you open the door and you go out. So I actually, I think that was the big moment for me. Went out, met Jefferson, and helped him out a little bit with the bottles and cans. But I was curious about what he, who he was and what he was doing. And he was a longshoreman who'd worked at the port. And this was his way of supplementing his income. He'd had a heart attack and all of this. And so I walked with Jefferson down Magnolia Row into Alliance Metals, this recycling center. And the door is open. And you just go in and you just go, my god, is this <laughs> America? And not necessarily in a bad sense. Mm -hmm. It was like a Fellini set, set. It was improbable. Everything about that place was just improbable. By any measure, half the people in Alliance Metals should have been dead, medically dead, legally dead, criminally dead, mm -hmm. emotionally. But there was life. It yeah. was like the most lively, bustling, energetic, creative place you could imagine. And style. There was also a lot of style in there. Yeah. And also extraordinary smells and sounds yeah. and all of this stuff too. And I was just, I don't know why or <laughs> what, but I just had to explore this, you know, it, uh, and it was, I mean, beyond the fun part of it, because a part of it, there was something about America's character that you could see there. There was something about human dignity mm -hmm. and strength and compassion yeah. and resilience that you could see there. And I had myself gone through terrible depressions and if it weren't for the family, I would have been, you know, I d can't claim to be the most sane person on earth by any measure. <laughs> so, so it gave me strength and, and, you know, remarkably just seeing yeah. people with nothing, creating life out of nothing. <sighs> the doors opened, <sighs> creativity yeah. started. Yeah, and it gave me something. And also, I mean, the other side of it was that living in on Mag Row, I could see why the recyclers were so annoying, right? Because <laughs> they go through your trash, they leave a mess. Or you come out and you sli slip on a piece of shit and you don't know if it's a human or a dog or whatever it is. Or somebody's looking at you in a strange way and you get, ner you know, there was a lot of, there, it's a difficult- In a sense, it's like walking into a war zone. <laughs> it is, yeah, totally right. But the right. first time you walk into Totally uh, right. An environment like that, it's the, the elements of it are always very oh, similar. Yeah. So the true. The tension. So true, Buna. I mean, what you're saying. And talk about elements. You see the stars that land on a stone. And you see the toll, weather, cold. Yes. All these things take yeah. on people. Yeah. Your clothes are getting soggy and mucky, and your socks are dirty, and your hair is thin. And, you know, it's hard. But, and then you don't particularly care about who's looking at you and, you know, it's a, you're, there's a state of, it's a state of considerable exhaustion. And survival. And survival. Survival takes a toll. Yeah. But then the people who were in Mag Row were also, you know, beautiful people. I mean, that's the other thing. This is the tension for me is that when they were talking about drug use, it was true. When they were talking about litter and things, it was true. I mean, so... The question was how, you know, how far could we take this? And so with my friend, partner, mm -hmm. Chihiro and I, my, we, you know, the vision for making the film wasn't to say, oh, these people in Mag Row are so uppity, or oh, these people on the street are so impossible. It was to see if we could use film as an instrument for building community, yeah. for having the dialogue. Because it's a cities, powerful medium it's beautiful mm -hmm. it's beautiful because you can get so close to people and people on mag row let us into their home landon let us into his life 
other characters recycle hers. Jay, the owner, let us into his life. Nancy Nadell let us into mm -hmm. hers. Mayor Dellums. I mean, yeah. everybody was offering us something because we were making the film, and we weren't taking a position. Mm -hmm. we, that's a lie. Uh, deep down, I do feel for the recyclers more, but it's not to undermine the legitimacy of the other points. It's just that for a community to function, we needed to have a conversation. And so, so let's hold on yeah. for a minute. Let, let's, um, so when the conversation started to happen, uh, what was the role that the recyclers played in the conversation? Because I'm sure the conversations were at the political level, they were also at the community level, but how much inclusion was there for the recyclers to show up and really speak truth to power? I mean, I've seen them do it at another mm -hmm. time in mm -hmm. another hearing, but recently I haven't been in touch with what's, what's happening well, currently. The truth. The <laughs> truth. Absolutely. The truth is that the recyclers weren't part of the conversation, in my view. Um, the truth is that the recyclers were a little bit of football, that there were different perceptions of the recyclers working themselves out. But the voice of the recyclers as recyclers wasn't so easy to hear. Um, Jay would occasionally, the owner of Alliance mm -hmm. Metals, would yes. occasionally go to city council and the recyclers would come and speak at the city council. But that wasn't really their voice, in a sense. That was the voice in the context of the conflict. Yeah, it's a script that it, you give to folks and say, we're going to city council, you'll have two minutes, yeah, and it's, this and is what you need to yeah, say. And, and, and actually, it wasn't that Jay was necessarily giving them the script. I mean, no. they, there was no. a sense that this is, you know, there's a professional pride that the recyclers have. But they're not organized as a force or a movement. Um, so. For me, the interesting part was actually getting close to the recyclers. I, the film originated with the conflict, but then after you, we, the, you, know, you meet Landon, and mm -hmm. he t the, stories, the stories transcended the conflict. They were greater than the neighborhood. They were greater than the city. They were powerful American stories. And so we just, we just Followed yeah. land. <laughs> yeah. So that's what that's what I want to uh, ask is, um, you know, how this relationship started from your uh, point of view, and uh, how you feel about the film and the role uh, that the film might play in the community of recyclers, as well as educating folks as to, uh, you know, how people do have to work very very hard to make ends meet, even if they might not have a job. People do have to work very hard. Yeah. A homeless person in one day mo usually walks more and goes oh, a yes. longer distance yes, to absolutely. find food in one place, absolutely. something else somewhere else. It's like a full-time job, okay. you know, uh, just just yeah. to put food in your mouth yeah. in, our, in our community. Well, I think it's more than just the homeless aspect because mm -hmm. there's such thing as live and let live, but just as long as you don't infringe on the rights of others. And there's a lot of people who push carts around who are not homeless. They have homes right there. They just use it as a vehicle, you know, to transport their, their uh, recycling. It's, it's a lot cheaper than driving their car, mm -hmm. and they can hold more generally when they tie their bags to it, you know, and it's exercise. <laughs> so there's a lot more to it. But I, I like to go back to where, when you spoke of Magnolia Row and things like that, you know, there was a movement that happened in Oakland um, during the time Jerry Brown was... Uh, uh, the mayor and that movement was to bring a change to West Oakland or to, to Oakland in general. To gentrify. To ge I was going to yeah. use the word, yes, but you go ahead. Yes, to gentrify. And um, uh, so it wasn't a racism type of thing. It was just we want to bring in more middle class type uh, people. And they figured that uh, West Oakland was prime properties, mm -hmm. schools, close to schools, close to the freeways, close to San Francisco. Close to all access, everything is close to the water. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's like beachfront property. So um, he started bringing people in. So these people came in, and they were, I think there was a thing that said, don't worry about nothing. We're going to take care of everything down there. So these people came in with some expectations, but they weren't able to move. But these people have been in this community for years. Sometimes this was three and four and five generations yes. of people <laughs> who have been right there in that West Oakland area, and some of them had you know, lost their way. Uh, some of them had family, had homes there, 
and some act like they're homeless, they're, they're not, and some were, were uh, addicts and, uh, or whatever they were doing, and others were, you know, um, conformed to society, but they're all living in the same house, you know, there was grandmothers, mothers, and aunties, and mm -hmm. so forth, and cousins, there, were, there was a lot of people. And so they, there's a misconception about all the people that you see push, pushing shopping carts were homeless people and, and, or just knaves, and, and they weren't. Now, admittedly, that uh, it became a community. People flocked there, but they did that for safety purposes, you know, and for camaraderie, you know. Yeah. And it, it was just really community. And, um, and the, uh, a lot of the blight there was not even caused by the recycler because people use West Oakland as a dumping, dumping ground. ground. Yeah. They come from all over. You see people come with their trucks from wherever mm -hmm. and just dump stuff out there. Yes, uh, once in a while, maybe if someone would uh, ask someone in the neighborhood who was in the neighborhood here take this and put it on your cart and drop it off down the street and I'll give you so much money so you know everyone had a part in that you know so but um, there's some decent people that people look at because they look at their appearance they don't know that these people were or should have been rocket scientists so to say should have been teachers should have been mm -hmm. whatever uh, uh, po political people should have uh, been lawyers or whatever, could have been uh, great at sports, uh, could have been great at art, you know, uh, and things like that. So um, I think the, what the film did was it did kind of was trying to like where the recycling was concerned and the gentrification and all that. But it really took a turn um, for the good when it started uh, interviewing the people and you started to find out that these people actually have something to say. And they actually have the same heart and character as anybody who was in mm -hmm. Magnolia Road, anybody else. They, they wanted the same things, you know. They, they wanted a, a better life, uh, you know, but they needed an opportunity because they had spoiled them, you know. They had spoiled their chances, and, you know, um, squandered a lot of their talents, you know, through misuse. And, and time goes on, and, you know, and they're trying to catch up with time. But um, a lot of people have a lot of good sense, you know. And actually, uh, you know, everyone, you know, in may not want to come out, maybe some people are just complacent, but there's a lot of people, if you give them the opportunity, they'll come up out of there and, and they'll be productive citizens in the community and they'll probably still recycle, just like I do. <laughs> so true. Amir, um, is this the first documentary that you're making? It is, perhaps the last, it <laughs> might be the last two. <laughs> no, don't say that. Uh, um, as the process goes on, um, how long is it going to take from the beginning to when you're done and it's ready to be shown? I would say maybe five, six years. Five, six years. Yeah, so we're going to see people's lives sort of transform as the time passes, it's been, as the film is being made. Yeah, it's taken, it's taken, I initially honestly thought it was two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> This is how... <laughs> we honestly thought we could just show up and do this show also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, not, I mean, I'm joking a little bit, but once you understand the dimensions and the human dimensions, and then it really grows on you. I remember you asked how the film started. Mm -hmm. Part of it was with Jefferson. Big part of it was with Landon. Because I remember picking up the camera and going out... It was around two o'clock in the morning and everybody in the house was, well, actually nobody knew I was going out, but the, when they found out that I'd gone out into the streets of West Oakland at 2 a.m., it was like madness, it was, you know. But outside Alliance, um, Landon was there and uh, it was around two in the morning and we struck a conversation from around two till maybe five, six in the morning. Didn't let Landon sleep. <laughs> <laughs> And I still remember... That's how friendships are formed. Yeah, and it was, you know, pitch darkness. So Landon couldn't see me. I couldn't see Landon, really. It was just... But his voice, the power of Landon's voice, its echo, its mm -hmm. softness, its sweetness, its beauty, its, it just blew me away. And also the scholarship. <laughs> I, I still remember we were talking, and in the middle of all this thing, it was like, I'm asking my silly questions, and Landon's... I don't know what it was, but he started telling me about the etymological origins of the word pharmacopoeia. I still <laughs> remember them. And, yes. And it just, you know, it was just a deep exchange. And I just knew that, wow, this is Landon. And then I met Jason, 
or before or after, I can't remember, uh, was another of the characters in the story. And Jason is like the Olympic titan of recycling. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you look at Jason's shopping cart, and it just, like, honestly, Houdini and Einstein <laughs> couldn't figure how he's put all those bottles and things on that shopping cart. And when he explains it to you, you realize the depth of the intelligence that goes into just pushing a shopping cart. You think it's easy, but <laughs> when you have to, it's actually like navigating a ship through stormy mm -hmm. water. You have to get the balance, balance yeah. right. You have to know how to attach the carts to each other. In Jason's case, okay, he's got a difficulty with his leg. So he, he has this dog called Monster, beautiful yes. dog who helps him out. And you know, you just, and it's just, it's just creativity yeah, it is. It on us and strength it and is. character. I mean, in the sun, in the rain, in with pain that honestly, literally anybody else with that level of pain that Jason has, they would, they would just surrender to everything. Mm -hmm. It would just, but the strength, you know, he and then purpose and oh, what he's doing. Oh, yeah. And art. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's science and it's art. And it's like, yeah, maybe Jason didn't get a doctorate, but Jason is a genius at what he does mm -hmm. and the way he does it. And then, you know, he explained to me, for instance, why he doesn't dress up. He's like, if I don't look like a bum, people get a lot more scared when I go to take their trash. But if I kind of look a little mm -hmm. like that, no, it's easier. And then, you know, you imagine the public relations. One would think it would be the other way around, but I, I'm understanding what it's, you're saying. I mean, to me, it was, it's kind of like camouflage. Mm -hmm. And then he explains the public relations of recycling. Imagine, like, how do you get close to a person's house? And then how do you kind of tiptoe over the boundary? <laughs> yeah. And how do you kind of <laughs> open up the trash can to kind of take a few little things and not have all hell break loose on you? Thief, stealing, murder, murder you know. Yeah. Ooh, ah, ah, ah. So it's, it's <laughs> not just a scientific, it's not just the science, it's a human art. Yes, it is. Right? Because yeah. you need, and I mean, Landon, oh, just, so, so all these things. And then to know, and the other thing about recycling, you need to hit your spots regularly. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> You have to reserve right. them. Yeah, yeah. You, you build their, yeah. and then you gotta watch out for poachers because mm -hmm. the other recycle. It's like the, it's like Exxon versus Mobil. I mean, when they were Exxon versus Mobil. I mean, there's competition. It's mm -hmm. economics. So I mean, the more you look at it, the deeper it becomes. The richer it becomes. The more expensive the it becomes. It takes. The longer <laughs> it takes. Yeah. Of course, then the beauty of it is that Landon shows you what human character is all about. Yeah. We're going to pause for a minute because we're going to show you four minutes of the documentary. Um, I hope you enjoy and send us comments. That would be very helpful. Recycling not only has saved my life, but my girlfriend was working on, on the street as a prostitute. She no longer has to do that because of recycling. As a person who, who works very, very hard for my money every day, I don't want to go to jail. I'm sick and tired of going to jail. And until I can get a job in Oakland, until I can get a job, I think that you should allow me to at least recycle. And all I'm doing is taking garbage. I'm not taking cars. They concentrate poverty in certain areas. And that's the only place they allow it to exist. This is the neighborhood where the poor, the unemployed, this is where they end up. This is West Oakland. Poor people are seen as powerless people. Poor people are seen as people who don't participate. Poor people tend to be seen as people that you can dismiss. I've been a recycler for about 15 years since I was a kid. And I piss everyone off because I pull more stuff to uh, any recycling center than anyone can. It's pretty hard to stay healthy when it's cold and it's raining on you and you still gotta go out and get your route. And on top of that, 
If you have health problems, it's really hard to stay alive. I've mostly been alone all my life. Sometimes loneliness can overbear a person. I first met Willie when I came here to Oakland. He just was a person that was caring. And that was something, you know, I probably hadn't had in a long time. He always be with me. It's like my mentor. And I miss him right now. I believe that everything can be redeemed. You know, like they say, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Some people just know me as preacher. If I can help a person, I will. No matter what I've been going through, even after I became a minister in and out of addictions, that I still kept the same character of giving people the word of God. In our heart by faith that we be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints. I was born in Seoul, Korea, 1953. I'm almost 57, and it's hard to try and find something. Up the hill, up the hill. One to each slip, but it's not easy. I have to do a little better than this. absolutely have no other options, I'm going to be doing this because I want my freedom. So don't put no jacket on what I do, and I won't put no jacket on what you do. And I'm somebody human as you are. But whatever little bit we can do, as people to help one another, let's just do it. This is redemption. Welcome back to Create Peace at Home. I hope that you're enjoying our show. Amir, I wanted to ask you, no, I think I want to ask you, Pastor, first before we go, go to you. There seems to be this thread of, um, you know, the notion of that all human beings are sacred, the way that both of you are speaking about the, uh, the recyclers and also the people who live in the community. And you also have Pastor, in front of your name. So there is some journey that happened there. Yeah. Would you please share that with us? Oh, um, wow. Well, like uh, I said before, I know I lived a long time on the streets and I'm gonna say this, that, you know, um, I've never felt as if I was homeless or poor, even doing the recycling and living out there, because I kind of had a sense of who I was. Um, and I made money, so, you know, but I just, it's, it's kind of like an oxymoron. I was just, I was a, I wasn't really homeless, but I didn't have a home. I understand that. Yes, it's kind of an oxymoron mm -hmm. like that. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. I knew one day I just didn't want to live this type of defeated life style anymore, you know. I didn't come from that. Mm -hmm. I was raised better than that, as they said. And, uh, and for a long time, I just got caught up in, in the whirlwind of that uh, community, you know. Uh, it's what, another oxymoron is that it's hard and easy at the same time because you don't really have a lot of responsibilities mm -hmm. to do, you know. Uh, but it's difficult to be out there to try to deal with people who don't want you out there for one thing and, um, and to, to live uh, uh, not knowing if someone's going to come and uh, uproot you from your camp or from your place that you've established. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the lack of respect that come to you, you know, because uh, they don't really know you, you know, and people look down at you. So it's, it's, it's an ugly situation. But I knew one day I had to, you know, return to sanity, so to say. And um, one morning, just, just to recap, uh, this gentleman, Amir, just came and stuck, a, came to me and said, may I interview you? And I just said, sure, and I just happened to be laying out in front of Alliance on, um, on a bedroll, like, and had my shopping cart there, and I had a little food to the side and stuff. 
just wanting to rest and here come this man <laughs> sticking a camera in my face as it can he interview me and I said okay and we just got to talking and uh, it just kind of went off from there but it kind of gave me some uh, incentive at that point in time because he was telling me how he you know, he cared for people and uh, how he was doing this film of uh, redemption and things like that. I said, well, something needs to be redeemed. <laughs> and, and it kind of, you know, it kind of triggered something there. And so we had a few uh, interviews out there and um, a few events happened that were uh, uh, tragic. You know, um, you know, I got into some altercations that weren't even, uh, you know, I, that I didn't, uh, uh, I, I didn't incite. And, uh, I knew it was time for me to leave there. And, um, but I had appreciated, you know, the friendship, you know, and, uh, and I was able to talk, you know, and I was able to do some self-talk at the time, even though I was talking and interviewing with them, I was able to do some self-talk. And it really gave me some incentive to get out of there. So I decided uh, one day uh, when I heard that a cousin of mine ha had something going on in Vallejo, and it was a place called People of Excellence, where a facility where you can come and start working on your life, you know, regain your balance again. And um, I decided I was going to leave and they came and they filmed me leaving and things like that. And I went there and I just uh, uh, dug in. And um, so I, re you know, got just getting my recovery in life. And uh, uh, but one thing for me, and I'll say this honestly, you know, I use the word Christian, I'll use it uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of generically, I'm just a follower of Jesus Christ, you know, I believe in him, I'm family believe in him, I don't knock anyone for whatever they believe and whatever, you know, to each his own. Nor would have Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> to each his own. I just believe in Jesus, I'm following him, you know, and, and that's what I do. And so I knew that uh, I had a calling in my life for that, and, uh, and so I spent um, three years, it's only been three years, I spent three years out there um, uh, studying, you know, and and being helpful and useful to uh, the People of Excellence Center. Um, took over the management of their uh, working crews and did a lot of stuff like that. Uh, did uh, um, estimates for jobs that they would get. All this was nonprofit. It was all just to pay for the place to keep the lights on. And I started going back into Oakland and bringing people out of Oakland into the place, you know. Some came and stayed for a while and went back and some came and stayed, went back and came back, you know. And just recently I picked up a couple of people uh, who had been friends of mine out there and they was telling me that I'm just tired and I want to get my life together. So I just reached back and, and brought them in and uh, um, I was, you know, we're, as well as a mandated going to church there and, and we had a fellowship uh, called Living Word Christian Center and uh, it was uh, run by uh, Pastor Bishop Daryl Winston and recently he turned uh, the fellowship over to me. And, Congratulations. Uh, yes, and so uh, I'm just taking over the fellowship and continue to do what his vision, his vision just to see people get their lives together. Mm -hmm. uh, he's looking at the downtrodden, the hedges, the highways, the byways, bring these people out. That's his vision. Because he was told before that you can't do anything with those people, you know, and he doesn't believe that and neither do I. Yeah. Once we start to believe that, mm -hmm. that's like saying, you know, certain kinds of people are not worth anything anymore. Well, I'm a prime society. example. I'm a prime and example. It's, um, I've worked in the homeless community for a long time uh, and have always said that one of the reasons we have not been able to solve the problem is that we don't have love for the people That's that true. we're trying to find solutions That's for. That's so true. we're not finding the solutions that they need. We're, we're just creating the solutions that the government has a little bit of money for or what we think people need. And so there's a lot of, you know, um, thinking for, for other people, speaking on behalf of other people. So the more models that we develop in our communities where people can really be at the tables where decisions are made and be able to powerfully speak their voice, those are the, that's one very critical opportunity that I believe the social services agencies do not do very well. Um, and sometimes it feels like, you know, we're now at this huge industry yeah. that mm -hmm. is supposed to solve the problems, but the industry spends more money on itself than on the solutions. Absolutely. And it just doesn't, doesn't seem that, that this is what's going to lead us out of poverty or no, uh, no. because homelessness is really just, you know, one piece of poverty. Yeah. Um, Amir, coming back to you, um, 
you got a grant from Sundance, mm -hmm. and uh, you're applying for other grants all the time. Mm -hmm. So what in you, in five years, has transformed and changed through this experience? Wow. I think it's one thing, you know, a lot of, a lot of people have done and worked with homeless people yeah. before I ever approached the question. And one thing that Susan Shelton told me, she yes. works with the mm -hmm. Housing Authority. She told me one day that, you know, people call me and tell me, she did like that, take care of that, take care of this, as though the city somehow customer service for, you know, taking care of the homeless mm -hmm. issue, and that you w move a magic wand and it gets all. And she said to me, I don't know why people are on the streets. Sure. but I trust their journey. Mm -hmm. I trust the journey. And I think, you know, when we started making Redemption with my friend Chihiro, um, I didn't know where it's going to go. I didn't know what the endings are going to be. I didn't know how much it's going to cost. I didn't, you just don't know these things. But at a certain point, you just learn to trust the journey. Absolutely. I think that's the biggest change for me. Yeah. I think what happened with people, uh, people get a sense that people don't want them, you know, so they just, you know, kind of commune together mm -hmm. and say, well, you know, we don't want you either, you know, and that's where the dialogue has to come because people don't show love one toward another. And I think it, it, if people just, um, you know, open their eyes and then just look at people as people and people who need help and, and, and offer some help to them, you know, people will take it. Uh, you'll find that a lot of the people that they thought were un incorrigible are very corrigible, you know. Um, make know your role and all that place right there. If the people there would say to them, hey, you know, you know, I know that you're working hard. I know that you're trying to, uh, you know, I know you're having, a, you're having a little bad, but, you know, every once in a while maybe you can come here and do a little work for me. I'll give you, a, you know, a, a little change. You know, people will mm -hmm. do that. And do me a favor, um, you know keep your, your place clean, and people will do that, you know, because there's a lot Absolutely. of people who do that anyway, you know, there's a lot of homeless people are just not messy people, you know, they have some integrity about mm -hmm. themselves, you know, you can come to some places and you'll find that they have a, a generator, they have, they have lights, you know, they might even have an air conditioner running, you know, they have things, they have their place uh, made up real well, they, they, they take pride in a lot of things, but that communication between uh, of what they may call the upper echelon of the people. And I think a lot of times this, the problem with it is the, the people that sits in the government mm -hmm. seats, you know, they're the ones that pushing the issue that, and causing the war between the two for whatever political reason they do it. You know, they're calling, causing the rift. Because like he says, you know, people make know your role and other people like that. You know, they're decent people. They make it a hard, a decent living, you know. But it was hard for them to come to a place and where they was promised, uh, you know, that we're going to make this uh, a rose garden. And when they got there, they found out that it was it wasn't a rose garden, and nobody is a rose garden. Doing anything they just about can't see it. Well, you understand what I mean. It's, yeah, yeah, it is. It's in, but, it's in the perception. You know, and but you know, people you expect people to come in, and now they are moving into a place where they're paying five hundred thousand dollars, you know, to live and then they look out their window and they see somebody sleeping out on the sidewalk right outside their place, you know. And they pick up the phone and call the city council yeah. person and then the city council person feels they have to do something because they want to, you know, get reelected. <laughs> and so they have to keep, you know, at least yeah. uh, the folks in the homes happy but because they also believe that uh, politicians believe that homeless people don't register to vote, they don't vote. Uh, there's a lot of myths about what the homeless people that do is and a don't myth do. Because that is and a myth. And I found that people are actually much more engaged that in is the a political myth. process that than is a they do politicians vote. think. They do vote. And a lot of times you go down and you see them have their buttons when they come out that yes. says, I just voted. Mm -hmm. it, they, uh, yes, they do. They do a lot of things, you know. So it's not like that. But they, they want to get back into, uh, you know, conformity with, with society, but no one to give them an opportunity. I remember that... Um, there was a few winters out there where it was really cold and really wet. And, um, you know, then the city uh, would open up some of these rec centers and have yeah, the Red Cross and people, that, yes. and they would uh, have the people come in for a night, maybe have a little bit of something to eat, which is nice. I mean, I'm not knocking that. That's a very, 
good thing to do. Um, and then they would have uh, uh, a television news service come and interview some of the people, you know, and they had interviewed me one time and I told them that this is very nice and it's really appreciated because it's really cold and it's really wet outside. Um, but it's really just a Band-Aid over a gaping wound, you know. Uh, you want me to really say something, but I'm going to tell you something that people were wet when they came in and they were cold when they came in and they spent the night and when they left out, they were still wet and they were still cold because it was storming that night and it was storming that morning. So you let them in at a certain time and they come out just for a moment and then you send them right back out in the rain. So this don't really solve the problem at all. But it makes people feel good. They feel, people, you know, people feel folks that are putting money into yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I'm know. not knocking them, I'm just saying that they're, 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 you have to look further than that. But I've always said to them that if this makes you feel good, if you built housing for all these people, imagine what that's gonna feel like. So God, I've been trying to have this conversation in Alameda County, is that you know we really, during certain times of the year, need to declare an emergency. Yeah. And then do the same thing that we would do if there was an earthquake you know, support people to rebuild their lives, yes. to really look at yeah. this as, you know. Yes, a, And I in agree. some I ways, agree. it is a human-made disaster. It is. And we're, we're not responding to that in the same way that we do to a cyclone or to a flood, uh, because it's, you know, nature. But human-made uh, created problems, we need to, to solve them with the same commitment yeah. that we do when all, you know, 3,000 homes get wiped out somewhere. They come right back up. Yeah. And um, here yeah. the challenge is a little different, but I think the approach needs to be similar. I think they dehumanize people too much when they come to that. They don't look at them as really human. And that's the problem with it, you know, and, and they just think they're worthless and they're not, you know. And like I say, I'm a, I'm a good example. I mean, I'm happily married now, you know. I have a great wife and everything else like that, just three years out of it. And the truth is, I, I can be honest, I still, I'm still unemployed. Mm -hmm. I just believe, I just trust in the grace of God. and. Uh, and that's almost incredible and unbelievable, but I'm happily married right now. And I'm believing for uh, uh, my life to you know, get better because I have to provide for my wife. It gives me even greater incentive. Mm -hmm. you know, I go out and I do odd jobs here and there and things like that. I still need more, but you know, I'm, I'm on my way. You know, I am on my journey and I, you know, and I, and I thank God for it. Um, so I, 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 it is appreciative when people open up shelters mm -hmm. and do the good things like that uh, but they do like you said need to look at it as more seriously as as a natural disaster also there is this the sense you know the emotion of fear uh 42 years ago when uh, i started to be on the street and work with folks and stuff people actually used to open up their homes to folks now they don't even want the folks to sit on the sidewalk i understand so uh, much has changed, and I don't see that as progress, and I don't see that as development in the American spirit. I see that more as going, you know, mm. going someplace that doesn't include everybody. And when we do that, yeah. that's when communities start to fall apart, irregardless of who's rich or who's poor. Yeah. And, you? and uh, you know, this goes to West Oakland and to systems, <laughs> because when you think of West Oakland, it's got everything for all kinds of progress. You have mm -hmm. ports, you have transportation, you have yeah. the best universities. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. there is nothing that's missing, except maybe a need for reimagining America, not just West Oakland, America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because how we see each other affects how we relate to each other. And this is the power of film. If you can shift perceptions, mm -hmm. right? Landon Thank shifts you. perceptions. Landon's story shifts mm -hmm. perceptions. That's the power of the story. From there, you can start shifting the way we think about the city. Because right now, as you were pointing out, a lot of people are dealing with deep trauma. I oh, dealt with absolutely. deep trauma. Absolutely. Right? As an immigrant, mm -hmm. your country has rejected you, right? Iran. So you're coming to a new country mm -hmm. with a sense of rejection, which is what a lot of the recyclers are also. Mm -hmm. I mean, we yes. have some things in common, rejection, displacement, <laughs> confusion, yes. all of these things. Yes. Well. Yes. And then you want to reclaim, you need some base from which to reclaim. And maybe for, for me, for Chiro, for the film is part of that. But we also need to reimagine 
the city because the way the cities function, I worked in a factory for a mm -hmm. bunch of years, and I don't know how much, you know, uh, when you make, and it was a Coke factory, so you're making cans. And when you had a bad product go out in the world, and I don't mean this in a, a product that was not acceptable mm -hmm. for whatever reason, mm -hmm. it would get rejected and come back to the factory. So instead of you making, I don't know, $10 on a 12-pack of Coke, <laughs> you would end up having to absorb $200, $300 for that rejected, rejected product. And nobody in the factory, not quality control, not marketing, not production, nobody accepted responsibility for that cost. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the city is also like a factory. And we tend to think of people who are hurt or damaged in personal terms. What was wrong with him? Ew, I don't want to drink that. Uh. But the factory is malfunctioning. And we have to Clearly. look at big time. And especially, uh, uh, but the knowledge is also within the factory. Do you know? Because there is the marketing that's done its job, quality yes. control, education, you know. Yes. And then you do education, health, housing. It, it's yes. all of these combined. And so an approach that doesn't have love get stuck in the barriers between departments, in the barriers between budgets, in the barrier, and all that nonsense. Meanwhile, all these people are paying a very heavy price, including the homeowners, including the poor, including the rich. All of us are paying yes. the price. That's not smart. Yes. I think another ingredient that's missing is that the United States of America, that's how I like to refer to it, because I think Canada and sure. the South <laughs> are you know, having their own fun, um, <laughs> that we, in a two-party system that is supported by big money on both sides, is not democracy. And that until we, this is my personal views, uh, folks who are watching this show, that until we get to that point that we truly have a democracy that respects, mm -hmm. uh, you know, other people's points of view, instead of just those who have made yeah. it into a certain yeah. status who are respected, that we're going to continue to have different presidents, but similar policies. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, 40 years, however many presidents, um, you know, I've gotten to know their policies, they're not that different. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. isn't that imagination mm -hmm. that we need uh, in the halls of Congress or mm -hmm. the Senate, like there used to be 35, 40 mm -hmm. years ago when greater leadership yes. was stepping up. Now it just seemed once you get to Washington, you're taking care of your constituency and uh, raising as much money as you can so you can stay in power. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, let's spread the power out and let's see how it emerges in the communities mm -hmm. and really work with the communities in that kind of partnership. Yeah. where nobody is really the ultimate leader, mm -hmm. but that we're raising leaders all the time, grassroots yeah. up. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's going to have I to agree. change. Yeah. I agree. You know, I think that um, one of the things is, there's a scripture that says, you know, you earn money to give to those who do not have. And I think that um, one of the problems with this thing that in America is that the idea of capitalism is great. It's great that you would come and capitalize and, 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 and gain your, and wake your way, but you forget to give back, you know? So you hoard and you, you take greed. So, uh, it, and it's a sad, it's a sad situation. It's a sad commentary. Um, if people would say that, you know, we gain this money, then we just spread it around. Like you just said, we gain this money because it's not going to help a billionaire to give a million dollars to anything. It won't help a, a millionaire to give a hundred thousand dollars in mm -hmm. something to a cause or to help some people like that. But people just agree to hold on to money for what I don't know. What are you going to do with it? I don't know how many cars do you need? Mm -hmm. You know, how many houses do you need? I mean, I earned this, I made this. So I'm, you know, but what gee whiz, you know? Uh, so it's, it's a different, we can have, if we can have capitalism with love, you know, you got yeah. to, everything has to have this love and this charity. Uh, one of the things is that they believe they don't think that people deserve it because they're lazy or they're bums or, or you know whatever you know. But you never know in what reason cause people to be the way they are. And it's always like this: if people want to be a mess, then let them be a mess. But there's a lot of people who really generally want to do better, but they fell on some hard times. Uh, they made some bad choices. Uh, some people made some bad choices for them.
I want to thank both of you for coming in thank today and would love to see both of you and whoever else and you know be there when the documentary comes out once I have more time uh, we've already talked that I want to you know help support the um, the distribution the what whatever at the tail end I'll come in at the tail end so thank you very much Amir thank and you. thank you pastor Buna, we would also want to thank you yes. because you have been a pillar of love in this community. Yes, yes. And it makes us very sad to think that you might be transforming, but we <laughs> just want you to know all of us are holding on. And, you know, you've touched more lives than any film ever could. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for watching Create Peace at Home. We'll be back in a month with a new show. I'm leaving on